Good afternoon. My name is Richard Rom. I'm the program chair of the Northern District of California Historical Society. On behalf of the Northern District Historical Society and the co-sponsors of this program, the California Supreme Court Historical Society and the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society, we'd like to welcome you to today's presentation, The Demonization of Immigrants, Despot Refugees and the Supreme Court. Deep thanks go to the society's staff, including Katya Kisten of the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society, Kathleen Winters of the Northern District Historical Society, and Chris Stockton of the California Supreme Court Historical Society. The presentation today will be given by John Karagosian, who received his BA from UCLA and his JD from Harvard Law School. I won't say when, but in addition to having been Vice President and General Counsel of Sunkiss Growers, John has taught legal history for years at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. John's presentation could just as well have been titled Demonization of the Other or Demonization of Those Who Are Different. As you'll see, the same invective used today against those who are perceived to be different, either because of the color of their skin, their ethnic background, their national origin or their sexual orientation, to name but a few characteristics, is the same invective that was used against indigent whites from other states who migrated to California in the 1930s. We will have a question and answer session after John's speech, so please send me your questions by using the chat function on your Zoom screen. And with that, John, I'll hand it over to you now. Uh, thank you, Richard. And let me just repeat thanks to Katya Kisten, uh, Kathleen Winters, and Chris Stockton. Uh, they, they made this happen. Uh, so thanks to all of you. Our story starts during the Great Depression, 1939 to be exact, with a baby's birth in Texas. As was all too common at the time, the baby's parents were poor. The father, Frank Duncan was among the three and a half million Americans working for the Works Progress Administration, or WPA, which was one of President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal agencies. WPA wages were low, averaging $40 per month, but the alternative was usually unemployment. Unlike the current COVID pandemic, Unemployment during the depression resulted in no enhanced benefits and often no benefits at all. Soup kitchens, such as the one we're seeing now, were all that kept millions from starvation. Mr. Duncan had a brother-in-law who was living in Marysville, California. The brother-in-law, Mr. Edwards, drove to Texas to fetch his in-laws, the Duncans, so that the Duncans and their new baby would have some place to live. Fred Edwards of Marysville is the protagonist of our story. He was a lay preacher and apparently brave and hospitable, willing to drive 3,000 miles on those days poor roads to and from Texas in December of 1939. When, this, when Mr. Edwards arrived in Texas, his brother-in-law had $20 to his name, all of which was spent by the time they arrived back in Marysville. The Duncans and the new baby stayed with Mr. Edwards. As you can see, the house was not much by modern standards, but it was a roof and walls for the Duncans and their new baby during the winter. Mr. Duncan was unemployed, and after 10 days, he began receiving financial assistance. $20 per month from the Federal Farm Security Administration. The Farm Security Administration, which was another New Deal agency, was charged with reducing rural poverty. So far, we have an ordinary and common story. Ordinary that was until our protagonist, Fred Edwards, became ensnared in the legal system and learned that no good deed goes unpunished. Literally, the people of the state of California accused Mr. Edwards of a crime for bringing his brother-in-law into the state. Technically, Mr. Edwards was prosecuted 
for violating California Welfare and Institutions Code Section 2615. Let me read to you what 2615 provided. Every person that brings or assists in bringing into the state, any indigent person who is not a resident of the state, knowing him to be indigent, is guilty of a misdemeanor. Fred Edwards was tried in the Marysville Justice Court and convicted of violating that section 2615. The stipulated evidence being that the defendant, Mr. Edwards, knowingly brought an indigent person, namely his brother-in-law, into California. Mr. Edwards was sentenced to six months in jail, sentence suspended. Let's pause our story about Mr. Edwards and talk about California during the Great Depression, and especially about the migration of hundreds of thousands of poor, homegrown American refugees into the state. I want to give you some context here regarding Section 2615, the statute which was often referred to as an anti oki law. Historians often advise us to include contemporaneous standards as one perspective in viewing historical events. Also, as you all as judges and lawyers know, there are always two or more sides to a story. Good grief, sometimes a single witness will tell multiple and contradictory stories of, of his or her own version. So let's think about this anti oki law from historical perspectives. California's side of the story was that by the 1930s, the state was already suffering during the Great Depression. These sufferings in turn were especially acute in rural counties like Yuba County, where Marysville is the county seat. Actually, the entire nation's agricultural sector, including California farmers, ranchers, and workers, had suffered for years even before the stock market crash of 1929. The so-called Roaring Twenties excluded agriculture. Instead, throughout the decade of the 1920s, overproduction in the U.S., increased foreign competition, plummeting crop prices, unaffordable farm mortgages, and foreclosures all devastated agriculture. The following decade of the 1930s, the Great Depression worsened matters. Consumer demand dropped and financial credit tightened. Moreover, starting in 1933 in the Great Plains, dust, stormed, dust storms turned thousands of square miles into a true dust bowl, burying crops, suffocating livestock, and stripping away the topsoil upon which the region depended. Then, the following year, prolonged drought and drastic heat killed more crops more livestock, and more people throughout the Midwest. But Mother Nature was not the only villain. The federal government's well-intentioned New Deal policies aided and abetted the suffering. For example, the Federal Agricultural Adjustment Act tried to remedy overproduction by subsidizing landowning farmers for taking their acreage out of production. Farmers complied by following their worst land and continuing to farm the best. The worst land, though, was long the province of sharecroppers and tenant farmers, who comprised 60% of Oklahoma, Texas, and Arkansas farmers. Many of those sharecroppers and tenant farmers and their families suddenly found themselves dispossessed of their homes and livelihoods however meager they may have been. In addition, mechanization began to reduce the need for farm labor, again setting adrift hundreds of thousands of laborers and their families. Finally, many of the Midwest merchants, tradesmen like carpenters, and even professionals saw their livelihoods disappear, disappear too, as the region's entire economy withered. Nationwide, these agricultural crises coincided with two roughly simultaneous migrations. These migrations comprised millions of people 
such numbers being unprecedented in American history. The first migration was from the Deep South and is sometimes referred to as the Great Migration. In the 1920s and 30s, African Americans faced continued apartheid and racial terror, as well as the broader agricultural crises. By 1940, 1 1.6 million African Americans, plus dispossessed whites, moved north into the industrial cities of the Midwest, like St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, and Cleveland, and to such eastern cities as New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. The second migration, which concerns us, was overwhelmingly white, over 90% white, from the Midwest and Southwest. For simplicity's sake, I'll refer to this region as the Southwest. I use the term not to refer to Arizona, Nevada, and New Mexico, but in a more old fashioned way, meaning Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, Missouri, and parts of adjoining states. Between 1910 and 1940, over two and a half million people migrated out of this Southwest, especially from Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, and Missouri. Hundreds of thousands of these Southwest migrants ended up in California, which offered at least the hope of economic opportunity and the reality of higher welfare benefits. Popular history and our story of Mr. Edwards, remember Mr. Edwards who brought his brother-in-law from Texas to California. While that popular history focuses on the grapes of wrath scenario of poor farm families driving their overloaded jalopies into California's Central Valley. It also turns out that many of the migrants into California headed for Los Angeles and California's other cities. Cities offered job prospects and Route 66, which was the main artery into California, ended, ended in Los Angeles at the foot of the Santa Monica Pier. Various California officials tried to stem the migration. One notorious effort was the Los Angeles Police Department's so-called bum blockade. In 1936, the LAPD sent 125 officers to various bridges over the Colorado River, which forms the California-Arizona border, with orders to turn back or jail migrants who appeared to be poor. One wonders what kind of profiling was done to ascertain who was poor. The blockade was, was widely reported in newspapers and on newsreels. In fact, we have a short newsreel for you now. A blockade of vagrants is declared in Southern California. Los Angeles police adopt the motto, they shall not pass. And back to the border go wanderers barred from the promised land in what is said to be the first state blockade of its kind ever attempted. <laughs> Governor Moore of Arizona is among those who think the Californian idea is all wrong. As governor of Arizona, I do not propose allow this state to be a dumping ground for the transients that's headed for California. Meanwhile, at 16 points of entry, a vigorous search is maintained. Scores of families traveling en masse fall under the ban. Just where they'll go from here is something of a riddle. Incoming freight gets a thorough inspection by the hobo hunters. The cops claim this is the only way to stop an influx of criminals and relief seekers. Fingerprinting shows 60% have prison records, say the police. Criminals or just human beings in search of happiness, they make a perplexing problem.
less well known was the LAPD's dispatch of officers clear up to the Oregon border, 650 miles north, to turn away poor migrants there too. To put it mildly, the blockades engendered controversy. Some LAPD officers were deputized by California's border counties, giving those officers a thin veneer of authority. In the political arena, arena, as you heard, Arizona protested the blockade because Arizona then bore the burden of the migrants who were stalled in the desert after being turned back from California. Later, John Steinbeck memorialized that blockade in his book, The Grapes of Wrath. In any event, the blockades lasted only a few weeks. Of longer duration were the criminal prosecutions under Section 2615. Why this resistance to migration from Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, and neighboring states? Unlike the present day debate over immigration, almost no national, racial, ethnic, religious, or language differences existed. In the 1930s, Californians were mostly American citizens, white, of European ancestry, Christian, and English speaking. And so were the migrants. Rather, the differences were almost purely economic. At that time, for example, California's per capita income was double that of Texas, and many Southwest migrants were poorer still. But more than simple class bigotry was involved. In the 1930s, poor Californians' demands for public health and welfare were increasing. By the depth of the Great Depression, more than one in five Californians depended directly on public relief. At the same time, crop prices continued to plummet. In just three years, from 1929 to 1932, California's farm income fell by more than half. As a result, thousands of California farmers, my own grandparents among them, lost their farms to foreclosure. Low crop prices and high foreclosures caused farmland volumes to drop, excuse me, farmland values to drop further, which in turn led to lower property tax revenues. In those pre Proposition 13 days, California's local governments, which were primarily responsible for administering public health and welfare programs, depended almost entirely on property taxes. In sum, California's public sector was being squeezed. It was being pressured to do more, but with fewer resources. The deluge of poor, migrant, of poor migrants from the Southwest worsened this already imbalanced equation. These American migrants needed still more public services, education, health, and welfare, but added little to the tax base. As more and more migrants arrived in California, many ended up in migrant camps. A dozen or so camps were operated by the Farm Security Administration, the New Deal agency charged with reducing rural poverty. However, most camps were not operated by the FSA or any agency. These unofficial makeshift camps were especially squalid, lacking shelter, sanitation, and often potable water. In some, depression era California had some rationale, even if misguided and harsh, for trying to reduce the flow of poor people into the state. Enforcing the anti oki law was one tool here, and various district attorneys prosecuted a score of cases. Our Fred Edwards was one of those prosecuted. As I mentioned, he was convicted and sentenced for bringing his indigent brother-in-law into California. Mr. Edwards appealed his conviction to the Yuba County Superior Court, challenging the statute's constitutionality. The Superior Court conceded that it was a close question, but affirmed Mr. Edwards' conviction. Under California procedure at the time, no further appeal existed. The Yuba County Superior Court was the end of the line for our Mr. Edwards. 
except, except he could appeal the constitutionality of Section 2615 to the United States Supreme Court. The Civil Liberties Bar, embryonic in those days, had been interested in challenging states' anti-indigent laws. Samuel Slaff, a well-known New York City lawyer, represented Mr. Edwards, and the Supreme Court agreed to hear the case. Thus it came to be that Edwards versus California, which appears with my edits in your MCLE materials, went directly from the Yuba County Superior Court to the United States Supreme Court. Mr. Slaff, in appealing his client's conviction, made a twofold argument to the Supreme Court. First, California's law unconstitutionally burdened interstate commerce. Second, freedom of movement within the United States is a fundamental privilege of national citizenship, which cannot be abridged by a state. At the Supreme Court, the prosecution was originally represented by a private Marysville lawyer named Charles Augustus Wetmore, Jr., with Yuba County's elected DA also on the brief. Mr. Wetmore cited clear 19th century Supreme Court precedent about a state's police power, that power to protect the state's health, safety, morals, and general welfare included the right to bar indigents from a state. Mr. Wetmore then raised the problem of poor Southwest migrants. Let me read to you from his Supreme Court brief. Events of the last 10 years, that is the 1930s, have made this problem increasingly acute because of the attraction to California of paupers from other states because of higher relief benefits, old age pensions, etc. Mr. Wetmore's brief then noted that this migration has developed into a problem staggering in its proportions. So far, we might agree with Mr. Wetmore that Mr. Wetmore's arguments had some plausibility, even if we would disagree with his conclusions. However, Wetmore's tone changed as he launched into the heart of his argument that Section 2615 was a proper tool for California to keep out indigent American migrants. Again, I'm reading word for word from his Supreme Court brief. The social problem in the Southwest for half a century, the poor white tenants and sharecroppers, following reduction of, counter, of cotton planting, droughts and adverse conditions, swarmed into California. These unfortunate people were usually destitute when they arrived. Their ordinary routine has been, upon coming to California, first to go on federal relief for one year, and then to state and county relief roles indefinitely. According to Wetmore, this pattern became a vicious cycle. After the migrants earn a little money in the harvests, they send back home transportation for their relatives, generally the aged and infirm, and these immediately become and continue public charges. The brief continued. These migrants crowd together in the open country and in camps under living conditions, shocking both as to sanitation and social environment. Underfed for many generations, they bring with them their various nutritional diseases of the South. Their presence here with their habitual unbalanced diet and consequently lowered body resistance means a constant threat of, ep of epidemics. The brief's allegations worsened. Venereal diseases and tuberculosis are common with them and on the increase. The increase of rape and incest are readily traceable to the crowded conditions in which these people are forced to live. Petty crime among them has featured the criminal calendars of every community into which they have moved. 
ugly stuff. Before we move on, I can tell you that I've read the Supreme Court's entire file, and the record is bereft of any facts that support these various slurs. Mr. Wetmore's brief continued excoriating the migrants' politics as proven by experience in agricultural strikes, they are readily led into riots by agitators. Their coming here has alarmingly increased our taxes and the cost of welfare outlays, old age pensions, and the care of the criminal, the indigent sick, and the insane. Therefore, how can it be said that California should not have the power to bar proven poppers? This brief continued with, I guess, a flourish. Should the Southwest states that have so long tolerated and even fostered the social conditions that have rendered these people to their state of poverty and wretchedness be able to get rid of them by insignificant welfare allowances and drive them into California to become our public charges? Naturally, when these people can live on relief, in California better than they can by working in Mississippi, Arkansas, Texas, or Oklahoma, they will continue to come to this state. So the record stood after oral argument in April 1941. In the Supreme Court's internal conference after argument, individual justices questioned the meaning of the term indigent in California's law. Accordingly, the Supreme Court ordered re-argument for October 1941. On re-argument, the prosecution was represented by California's first term attorney general. The attorney general repeated the clear, if old precedent, that a state's police power included the power to bar indigence. The attorney general added that section 2615 was not overly harsh in that the term, quote, indigent persons, close quote, is narrowly defined. It means only that California may bar the bringing in of people who lack money and who have no relatives or friends able or willing to support them. One wonders whether Edwards himself could have been convicted under this new interpretation of Section 2615. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the Attorney General's careful re-argument contained no reprise of the earlier bombast about poor whites who've been underfed, underfed for many generations and commonly have venereal disease. On November 24th, 1941, the Supreme Court ruled Section 2615 was unconstitutional. All nine justices concur concurred, but for fundamentally different reasons. New Justice James Burns, formerly a U.S. Senator, and later to become President Harry Truman's Secretary of State, and then South Carolina's Governor, wrote for the five-member majority. Justice Burns opined that California's statute violated the Commerce Clause. Let me read from the majority opinion. The grave and perplexing social and economic dislocation which this statute reflects is a matter of common knowledge and concern. We appreciate the spectacle of large segments of our population constantly on the move and has given rise to urgent demands upon government. The state asserts that the huge influx of migrants into California in recent years has resulted in problems of health, morals, and especially finance, the, purport, the proportions of which are staggering. It is not for us to say this is not true. The majority opinion then turned. But in the words of Justice Cardozo, the Constitution was framed upon the theory that the peoples of the several states must sink or swim together, and that in the long run, prosperity and salvation are in union and not in division. Justice Byrne continued, it is difficult to conceive of a statute 
more squarely in conflict with this theory than the section challenged here. Its express purpose and inevitable effect is to prohibit the transportation of indigent persons across the California border. The burden upon interstate commerce is intended and immediate. It is the plain and sole function of the statute. Justice Burns admitted, it is urged that the concept which underlies section 2615 enjoys a firm basis in English and American history. We do suggest, however, that the theory of the Elizabethan poor laws no longer fits the facts. Recent years, and particularly the past decade, have been marked by a growing recognition that in an industrial society, the task of providing assistance to the needy has ceased to be local in character. The relief of the needy has become the common responsibility and concern of the whole nation. While Justice Burns' majority opinion limited itself to the Commerce Clause, it recognized two important concepts, which we may take for granted now, but which were modern in 1941. First, the nation has and continues to become more and more mobile. In other words, one's birthplace is no longer one's destiny. Second, the Great Depression is being recognized as a national event with national causes and a need for national solutions. By the way, Justice Burns served on the Supreme Court for only 15 months and Edwards was his only significant opinion. With this William O. Douglas, writing for himself and two other justices, concurred that Section 2615 was unconstitutional. However, Justice Douglas disdained the majority's Commerce Clause rationale. Let me read what he wrote. I am of the opinion that the right of persons to move freely from state to state occupies a more protected position in our constitutional system than does the movement of cattle, fruit, steel, and coal across state lines. Instead, Justice Douglas opined that the right to move from state to state is a right of national citizenship. Accordingly, California's anti-Oki law violated the 14th Amendment's Privileges and Immunities Clause. Finally, newly appointed Justice Robert Jackson, later to become the United States Chief Prosecutor at the Nuremberg Trials, wrote a solo concurrence. Justice Jackson agreed with Justice Douglas that Section 2615 violated Edwards' 14th Amendment privileges and immunities. For example, Justice Jackson cited a 1915 Supreme Court ruling that, after an alien is admitted into the US, the alien has a right of entering and abiding in any state of the union. Justice Jackson then reasoned, the world is even more upside down than I had supposed it would be. If California must accept aliens in deference to their federal privileges, but is free to turn back citizens of the United States unless we treat them as subjects of commerce. But Justice Jackson went further with some critical thinking about discrimination based on economic class. Okay, before I read from Justice Jackson's concurrence, some of you may be wondering about my ignorance here. As anyone who has taken even introductory constitutional law knows, the Supreme Court in 1973 in San Antonio School District v. Rodriguez held that for purposes of the 14th Amendment, wealth discrimination does not trigger strict scrutiny. I concede the point, but listen to what Justice Jackson wrote 80 years ago in Edwards. Here we meet the real crux of this case. Does indigence, as defined by the application of the California statute, constitute a basis for restricting the freedom of a citizen as crime or contagion 
warrants its restriction. We should say we should say now and in no uncertain terms that a man's mere property status without more cannot be used by a state to test, qualify, or limit his rights as a citizen of the United States. The mere state of being without funds is a neutral fact, constitutionally an irrelevance like race, creed, or color. Just as Jackson's eloquence grew, any measure which would divide our citizenry on the basis of property into one class free to move from state to state and another class that is poverty bound to the place where it has suffered misfortune is not only at war with the habit and custom by which our country has expanded, but is also a short-sighted blow at the security of property itself. Property can have more have, can have no more dangerous, even if unwitting enemy, than those who would make it its possession a pretext for unequal or exclusive civil rights. Just as Jackson's concurrence concluded with startling prescience, remember he was writing in November of 1941. If I doubted whether his federal citizenship alone were enough to open the gates of California to Duncan, my doubts would disappear on consideration of the obligations of such citizenship. Mr. Duncan owes a duty to render military service, and this court has said that this duty is the result of his citizenship. In contention that a citizen's duty to render military service is suspended by indigence would meet with little favor. Rich or penniless, Duncan's citizenship under the Constitution pledges his strength to the defense of California as part of the United States and his right to migrate to any part of the land he must defend is something that he that must be respected under the same instrument. Thus endeth the California the Supreme Court's Edwards versus California opinions. But our story is not ended. If you like irony, maybe even karma, let me give you three more endings. The first ironic ending is that Edwards, that the Edwards decision made no real life difference in California. How can that be? Less than a fortnight after the Supreme Court announced its decision, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and the United States entered World War II. California became a center of war industrialization, war industrialization and its economy boomed. When I say boomed, I mean boomed. In Northern California, for example, Richmond became the location of four huge Kaiser shipyards, which during the war built a total of 747 Liberty ships, Victory ships, and other ships in assembly line fashion. To keep up this pace of turning out four ships a week, week after week, month after month, the yards had to work around the clock, as you can see from this nighttime photo. The yards needed workers, a lot of workers, and Richmond, Richmond, and the Richmond shipyards eventually employed 90,000 people. And Kaiser had to recruit workers from, a far, from as far away as the Gulf Coast and East Coast. The town of Richmond alone quadrupled in population from 24,000 before the war to 100,000 by 1945. In Southern California, aircraft manufacturing was the dominant industry. As but one example, Lockheed, Lockheed Aircraft's Burbank plant also employed 90,000 people and produced almost 20,000 planes during the war. Like Richmond, Burbank's population quadrupled from 17,000 to over 70,000. Douglas Aircraft, headquartered in Santa Monica, employed 160,000 people, mostly in Southern California. At the same time that wartime manufacturing boomed, many potential workers became unavailable. A million Californians served in the military and accordingly were out of the civilian labor pool. 
Over 100,000 Japanese Americans from California were imprisoned in camps and also unable to join the labor force. With these twin trends, a huge and growing need for labor, but a shrinkage of the local labor pool, California went from keeping, trying to keep people out to trying to lure people in, from having a labor surplus to an acute labor shortage. With higher employment and wages, California's per, per capita income doubled and total personal income tripled during the same years. State tax revenues also increased. More broadly, these workers, including migrants from across the nation, fueled California's economy and built the ships, planes, and other goods that helped the Allies win World War II. The bottom line here. Even if the Edwards case has been decided the other way, if the, Cal if the Supreme Court had ruled that California could enforce the statute and keep out indigent American migrants, California would not have used this enforcement power. Section 2615, regardless of its legal enforceability, was a dead letter. The state's economic needs and the nation's defense needs would have trumped Edwards' legal authority. Edwards versus California's second ironic ending reverses this meaningless. The Supreme Court's decision may have lacked any real life effect in 1941, but, of a, but a quarter of a century after it was decided, Edwards' legal bases were resurrected during the civil rights era. For example, in 1966, in the United States v. Guest, the U.S. Supreme Court reviewed a federal statute which made it a crime to interfere with a citizen's enjoyment of any right or privilege secured to him by the Constitution. Several individuals, Klansmen among them, were indicted for interfering with African Americans' rights to travel on public streets and highways. In upholding the indictment, the Supreme Court held that the right to interstate travel is a privilege guaranteed by the Constitution. The primary authority for that guarantee was Justice Douglas's concurring opinion in Edwards versus California. Justice Douglas's 1941 concurrence thus became cited as precedent in 1966. Also in 1966, the Supreme Court struck down Virginia's poll tax in Harper versus Board of Elections. What does a poll tax have to do with Edwards versus California's right to interstate travel? Listen to what the Supreme Court ruled in the Virginia poll tax case. The Equal Protection Clause demands no less than substantially equal state, leg state legislative representation for all citizens of all places as well as of all races. We say the same, whether the citizen otherwise qualified to vote has a dollar fifty in his pocket or nothing at all, pays the fee or pays to feel it, to or fails to pay it. Wealth, like race, creed, or color, is not germane to one's ability to participate intelligently in the electoral process. Lines drawn on the basis of wealth or poverty like those of race, are traditionally disfavored. What authority did the Supreme Court cite? Quote, see Justice Jackson's concurrence in Edwards versus California. I think about the incongruities here. Edwards dealt with a statute aimed at keeping out migrants, overwhelmingly white as it turned out, but is cited as a precedent to enfranchise African-American voters. Edwards involved a statute in, intended to keep out migrants from the Southwest, including the old Confederacy. And now it is used within the old Confederacy. Most of all, look at how Justice Jackson's solo concurrence about economic class resonated 25 years after it was written and a dozen years after the justice's death. In 1972, Papa Cristo versus City of Jacksonville, 
the Supreme Court to struck down state and local anti-vagrancy laws, finding that the laws violated the right to travel, again as established by Edwards. In sum, Edwards versus California established a constitutional right to travel from one state to another, a right immune from federal or state interference. Edwards also cast a little doubt on laws penalizing indigence. Edwards' authority here, while not cited in 1941 or 1951 or even 1961, became an important and well-established principle as the United States finally began to protect civil rights. I doubt whether any of the Edwards parties, lawyers or justices could have predicted these consequences. In tossing a pebble into a pond, you never know where the ripples will appear. Edwards versus California had a third and final ironic ending. I mentioned that on re-argument in 1941, California's first term attorney general urged the Supreme Court to uphold section 2615. As you now know, the Supreme Court disagreed, unanimously invalidating the statute. As you also now know, the Supreme Court, a quarter of a century later, cited to Section 2615's unconstitutionality in some of its landmark civil rights cases. The irony is that the California Attorney General who urged Section 2615's validity and the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, which cited to its invalidity, were one and the same person, Earl Warren. Thank you all, uh, and I'm now glad to answer some questions. Um, let's see. Uh, we did have one question, uh, which was, uh, can you discuss the criminalization of the drugs used by quote unquote, the other, for instance, the Chinese, the free blacks, the Mexicans uh, fleeing from the Mexican revolution. The, the, uh, the case really focused on just the migration of Americans within, the, from one state to another. It didn't really discuss uh, foreign immigrants other than Justice Jackson's comment that if aliens could move from state to state, ordinary Americans ought to be able to also. Um, interestingly though, uh, if this became a series and this is the, the first pilot, we were thinking of doing uh, something on the Sylvia Mendez decision, uh, as well as uh, one of the cases from the Chinese Exclusion Acts. Uh, so, there might be uh, room for uh, dealing with some of these topics at least. And then John, one that you'll appreciate, uh, which is, uh, does the presenter plan to expand on this story by writing a book on the topic? I know I would welcome such a work. It's, it's interesting that, that that was asked. I actually am involved, uh, the University of Kansas Press, has a series of books, I think it's called Landmark Law Cases in American Society. And over the last couple of months, I've been in contact with them. Uh, they've asked me to submit a formal proposal. Uh, I've done so. I spoke with the editor as recently as today, uh, asking for some revisions. Uh, and so if the, the university press goes along, uh, the answer is yes, this may be expanded into a book. Thank you. Then uh, we have a few questions about really what happened to uh, the people involved in the case. What happened to Mr. Edwards? What happened to uh, his sister, his niece, nephew? I, I wish I knew the answer to those questions. That's Those are exact issues that I talked with the university press editor about in terms of expanding the book. I, I don't know about the Edwards or Duncan families. I do know that Samuel Slaff, the lawyer who 
took the case to the Supreme Court, had a very distinguished career as a civil liberties lawyer. Um, this was one of several cases that, that he had. Uh, and then, of course, I know a little bit about some of the individual justices who decided the case, but I do want to do some more research into the Duncan and Edwards families. You know, John, you, you mentioned that your grandparents lost their uh, farm. And uh, one of the questions was, uh, does your family have roots in Oklahoma? No, my family does not have roots in Oklahoma. I, I, but, but my grandparents who had a small farm in the, in the San Joaquin Valley, which they lost, and eventually they were able to acquire another farm, which they were able to keep. Um, a lot of their neighbors were, were migrants from Oklahoma, Texas, and Arkansas. And part of the interest that I have uh, in this case uh, grew out of meeting some of those people uh, when I was a young boy on my grandparents' farm. Uh, another interesting question. Did Justice Warren ever address his uh, attorney general role in the 1941 case? He what, Richard? I'm sorry, I didn't hear did, that. Did uh, Justice um, Earl Warren ever address his attorney general role in the Edwards 1941 case? Not that I'm aware of. I've, I've read all the cases that I cited, and there's more cases, by the way. I didn't want to bore everybody with too many cases. But as far as I'm aware, he never mentioned that he was, in effect, the losing lawyer in, in Edwards versus California. <laughs> And a follow up to that would be, what do you make of his uh, different positions from 1941 to in the 60s? Paul, there's a lot of people, probably including a lot of audience members, who know a lot more than Earl about Earl Warren than I do. Um, but certainly, one thing you can say about Earl Warren is that he had an enormous capacity for growth. Uh, and, and some of the positions he took as attorney general and even as governor of California. Um, he later apologized for uh, and, and became, in, in my view, a heroic figure uh, in American history. In, in particular, for instance, uh, the uh, Japanese-American uh, locking up uh, those of Japanese heritage uh, in, in camps. You said great men like Earl Warren have shortcomings. Well, more than shortcomings, have flaws. And 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 certainly his prejudice against Japanese Americans during World War II was was one of his one of his flaws. This was a great presentation. Do you think that some of the states implementing quarantine rules in 2020 for those entering the states took caution from this case and trying to set up the restrictions? Now, the, the public health seems to be kind of an important exception in this. And I think a lot of states have used the public health exception uh, to bar travel from one state to another. I don't profess to be an expert on, on how that's worked in COVID, uh, but, but even uh, some of the language that I read to you uh, earlier this afternoon talked about contagion, for example, being a basis for keeping people out of, out of states. And do you believe that the case could help immigration cases on the right to travel? I think the answer is yes. Maybe not necessarily in terms of strict legal application, but maybe looking at our history and looking how we treated migrants even from other American states, maybe can help open our minds to looking at migrants from other countries. Uh, then um, could you repeat the name of the 1968 case that relied on Justice Jackson's concurrence? It was a 1966 case uh, and it was called Virginia versus, excuse me, the 1966 case that relied on Justice Jackson's concurrence, Harper, H-A-R-P-E-R, versus Virginia Board of Elections. Well, 
Well, I think that's all we have time for, but I, I can say there are a number uh, just simply complimenting you, John, on the presentation. And wow. I would like to do so as well. It was fantastic. And thank you so much for doing this. Thank you all very much. I've enjoyed it. Uh, thank you. Thank you.